Uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. Welcome to a wonderful panel today about small museums and galleries. We are very lucky to have uh, four panelists willing to give up their time today and to give us some insight into their world. So we have um, Clara Muir and we have Jackie Healy and Karen Payne and Tapra Redhiakita. So we are going to be talking to these lovely ladies and getting to know a little bit about uh, their museums and galleries and life. Well, maybe not too much about your personal lives, but feel free to share if you feel bold. <laughs> um, today, we're really wanting to talk about small museums and galleries and some of the challenges, but also what is one of the wonderful things about being in a small institution. We would like to celebrate uh, those organizations and also acknowledge just the sheer volume of work that they often do. So uh, we're, we're gonna jump right into having each of our wonderful panelists give a little introduction and some information about a project they've been working on. And then we'll be having some discussion time and we will be having lots of time for questions. So if you have anything for our panelists, please leave it in the chat. Um, it'd be great if you could say your name and what organization you're from just to help give some context. But uh, we'll kick start with Claire. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have a presentation. I've just got some notes, so I'll run through this for you. Um, I'm the Art Collection Officer at the Deakin University Art Collection and Galleries Unit. I've been working here for almost five years now, and I use Vernon almost every day in my role, which is essentially a combination of registration and collection management. Uh, for a bit of background information, we've got a small team of four people in our unit, including myself in my full-time role, a full-time senior manager, full-time curator, and a part-time administration officer. Of those four, only three of us use Vernon on a regular basis, and I'm the primary person who works with the data to add change or update information as necessary. Our main office is based in Burwood in Melbourne, but we have artworks on display across all the campuses, including Waterfront, which is in Geelong, Warren Ponds and Warrnambool. Our collection currently consists of approximately 2,300 artworks. We focus on contemporary Australian art, although we do have some works by international artists. Key areas of focus within the collection are sculpture, artist books, and works that have a connection to Deakin, such as those by staff, students, and alumni. The unit's collection was originally recorded in card catalog form and later in a special purpose-built computer database. The program was replaced with Vernon in 2013 and the whole collection was transferred over to the new system. Now, because the original database had a simpler structure and fewer categories for data to be entered in, this has meant new opportunities for enhancing the information on Vernon. Some of the fields that have not been used as frequently in the old database, such as credit line, edition and signature marks have been needed to be updated in Vernon. So our long term overarching goal is that we want to put our collection online, where it will be accessible to the general public and open up opportunities to engage with a wide variety of audiences. So with this plan in mind, over the last few years, we've been working to add and update as much information to our records as possible. I began with a series of searches on Vernon to discover where there were gaps in the key data. And after discussion with the team, we decided to prioritize the artworks without copyright approval and the artworks without credit lines. To source the missing credit lines, I've cross-checked the data on Vernon with the previous database, the old card catalog, and any information that was available on the hard copy of the artist's files. And then I manually updated the fields as necessary. It's taken a couple of years, but I'm almost there. I think I have 30 records to go out of 2,300, so that's not too bad. <laughs> Um, updating the copyright information has been a, another challenge. Um, the old database had different fields on Vernon, so the copyright owner field did not necessarily transfer over and was therefore blank in Vernon, even though we might have the rest of the information. So I'm in the process of going through every record to update the copyright owner when we have the information and to identify which artists need to be contacted. This project has also been a really helpful opportunity to update current biographical and contact details for the artists in the person file in Vernon and we're looking to update more information about our First Nations artists as well. There's a, a great section on there where you can include language and community as well. 
So the process has led to a flow on effect where we're working on a big project to get all our copyright up to date. So this has been one really big positive of outcome of lockdowns and working from homes is that we can really focus on this project. So for those who are interested, the basic process I use is, um, is as follows. I identify records that still require opera, um, copyright using the select statement function to search for object without copyright owner. I then use list manager to select the fields we need for the copyright forms and I export this to Excel. And this is one of my little nifty Vernon tips is that I find it easy to control the data in list manager and then when it, that exports to Excel it also exports the thumbnail image as well. So using this format I can send the Excel list to our admin officer who merges the information with our pre-designed and solicitor's office approved license to reproduce images form. Our admin officer sends the form off to the artist or their representative. And once the forms are returned, then I update the data manually in Vernon. Uh, we save a digital copy to the share drive and print a hard copy for the artist's file. So you can see it's a lengthy process, but with a great team effort, everybody's been contributing. We're really getting there. And one last thing I just wanted to mention before moving on is about audits. Um, Conducting audits is a great way to become more familiar with the physical collection, particularly for small museums. And Vernon has proved really, really helpful in this regard. So we conduct a full audit of every single accession artwork in the collection every three years and a partial audit for the other two years. So this helps us keep up to date with the location and the condition of the object. So we can identify anything that needs to be removed, relocated, refreshed, or anything like that. So I use Vernon to create my audit lists and then I use it to process the completed data. I search for the accession objects by current location and gen generate a document for each campus, which includes the general information, um, you know, accession number, title, artist, medium, etc., and an image. And then I print out two copies of this and we have two people from our unit go around and view every single artwork physically. Um, and noting any changes to condition. Once the physical component has been completed, I run a bulk update on Vernon to show that every work on the list has been cited. I then run a printed report to double check the locations and produce a report at the end so I can provide an executive summary to the officials so that we've got a record of everything that's happened. So as a final benefit of that, um, the advantage of the audit process is ensuring that the data is collect correct for the revaluation of the collection. We undertake our valuation every three years, which is why we do a complete audit in the year preceding it. So that's just a bit of a summary. Um, and that, that's me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it sounds like a lot of work to be doing every few years. It's enjoyable, though. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's the registrar in you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for that, Claire. Um, we'll next be visiting Jackie. Jackie, would you mind giving us a little bit of an overview of yourself and um, your institution, as well as uh, what project you might have been tackling lately? Of course. Look, I'd just firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm on, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to elders uh, past, present and emerging. I'm Jackie Healy, I'm director of the museums uh, at the Faculty of Dentistry, uh, Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Uh, there are three museums, the Medical History Museum, the uh, Harry Brooks Allen Anatomy and Pathology Museum and the Henry Foreman Atkinson Dental Museum. When people, I tell people that I'm curator of the uh, Medical History Museum, they say how interesting. When I say that I'm involved with the Henry Foreman Atkinson Dental Museum, they say, I hate the dentist. This is my challenge. How do we convert that strong emotion so we had a major project in 2019. We celebrated the 135th anniversary of the establishment in 1884 of the Odontological Society of Victoria, which brought about the development of the first dental school in Victoria. The exhibition and publication, Dentistry, Innovation and Education, explores the development of dental practice, education and public health in Victoria. The beginning of the collection of the Henry Foreman Atkinson Museum is intrinsically related to the Odontological Society.
because at their early meeting in 1884, they decided to create a library and a museum. And a very generous Mr. Blix gave a cedar wooden cabinet for that purpose. The Australian College of Dentistry, which opened in 1897, became affiliated with the university in 1904. And we need to compare this to when Melbourne uh, Medical School began. That was in 1862. So you have dental education in Victoria pioneered by a professional association, not by the university. This is a story of leaders in anaesthetics, plastic surgery, and history, history of dentistry is full of remarkable individuals. So our dental museum is considered the oldest and most comprehensive dental collection in the Southern Hemisphere. And I think we can challenge many collections um, in the Northern Hemisphere. We have objects, artifacts, equipment, books, and photographs, many relating to the teaching of dentistry and related courses in the faculty. So how did we start this project? We went to Vernon to see what we had in our collection. And we found that many of our objects did not have adequate information for us. So we went for a physical search. And then, as luck would have it, we found this neat little pile of early photographs from the 1920s from Mildura uh, with lovely handwritten notes beside it, a gift that had never been catalogued. We've all found those things, haven't we? And we put that immediately into Vernon. It was given by a very prominent uh, local dentist and it was a picture of his father in his surgery in Mildura. I then uh, had a, a briefing with the head of the dental school. Now, Fanny Gray, and we have some images that could go up. Fanny Gray was our first female dental graduate. She graduated in 1907. The course began in 1904. And she, um, we always use the same image of her. Uh, I, don't you love this? This is one of the first dental hospital and school, and it's above the undertaker. Just, you know, in case something goes wrong, there's a handy outcome there. No wonder people are frightened. Next image. No, um, go back, this one. So this is uh, Fanny Gray. So we've always had this image. She's in our pamphlet. The head of the school said, Jackie, let's get another image for the anniversary exhibition. It was fine for him to say that, but we only had this one, we thought. But we went back to Vernon. We found uh, an image of students of the right era, two women you could hardly see in the front row. One of them was Fanny Gray, but it gets better. I got a random call. Don't we all love the random call? And they were offering me a gift to the collection, a pamphlet. They also just happened to mention that they were related to that woman on your pamphlet. Uh, I said, oh, you mean the one with the soldier? They said, yes. She said, yes turned out to be a direct descendant of Fanny Gray, who had all Fanny Gray's family photographs. So we have now photographs of her whole life, including her graduation photograph. This was two weeks before um, the publication was finalised. So it was a bit of a last minute, but a great outcome. We then um, had a recent gift. And we had had a student. It was a gift from... Henry Foreman Atkinson's family. Now that's part of the name of our museum. It was renamed in 2006. And Henry Foreman Atkinson was Dean of the dental school, retired in 1978. And then he volunteered every Wednesday until he was 103 at the dental museum. And he's a remarkable dental historian. Unfortunately, well, he died at 103 in 2015 but the museum owes a lot to him. So we had his collection that his family gave to us. We'd had a condition reported as we put it into Vernon. We discovered some things that looked interesting, but were in very poor condition. We had them conserved. One of them, which on the surface looked like a pile of sticks with a brass plate, after it was conserved, turned out to be an O'Connell, uh, a, sorry, a Mid-Connell portable dental chair uh, invented in 1900, the first lightweight dental chair. Well, how significant was that? 
and it came from Henry. So we were very excited. And finally, and, and of course that rich information went straight into Vernon, but finally, and most importantly, we commissioned a work by a young new artist, uh, Malkin Yapanda, and I'd like that to go on the screen. Now, the dental school has been working with uh, this community uh, for over a decade, providing dental services. We just asked for a contribution of what they would like to share with us. And what we have here, we got a, a pole and a bark painting of the story of, the, of first teeth. What happens in that area is when a child loses the baby teeth, they are thrown into the roots of the pandanus tree. These roots are equated with the reverse teeth of a shark, throwing the baby teeth into the tree is understood to encourage new teeth to quickly grow strong and sharp. These works acknowledge the strong basis of Indigenous knowledge in Australia, but also the relationship with the Melbourne Dental School. Now, this cultural story has never been shared before outside the local community and was shared with us for the very first time. Now, I have a final question. Who is afraid of the dentist now? Aren't you just inspired? Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Although I might still admit to being afraid of the dentist, but mostly for the bill. No, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that. I especially enjoyed seeing those wonderful images that you have. Uh, Karen's up next. Hi, Karen. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, hi, my name is Karen Payne and I work at the Cambridge Museum in the Waikato in New Zealand. Uh, we have a very small two-room museum which is based in the local courthouse um, and a research room. We've got three weekday staff and we've also got week weekend staff and volunteers. Uh, we're run by the Cambridge Historical Society and we're funded by a grant by a local um, the local council. So we're very community focused and um, Part of our collection policy says that all accessions should have a Cambridge connection. Uh, the main point of difference with our museum and probably others that are, are like us is that we have 70 odd years of research um, that's been built up since the 1950s. So we have files on local people, marae, organisations, buildings, um, businesses, schools, important houses, and there's all sorts of connections there. And we find that um, Vernon is just wonderful for getting all those connections put together. So when people come in and say, you know, they've got a great uncle or a great grandmother who lived in Cambridge, you know, we can actually go straight in there, bring the person record up, and we've got all these connections and it's quite quick and easy to do for research. Um, we're not quite up to date. We're, we're way behind the, the eight ball, but we, we sort of gradually update them as we go along. And um, in 10 years time, it's gonna be brilliant. Um, in 20 years time, it'll just be amazing, but we still won't be up to date. We'll never be up to date. <laughs> but we um, just keep on working, working at it. Uh, we've got a fine collection of um, photographs, um, Maori taonga artifacts and Cambridge literature um, as well. Um, but the project I wanted to talk about is, um, is because we're so small, we're actually looking at building um, down the side and at the back of our museum and um, that the footprint of the new building will actually go right over our collection store. So what we've had to do is take our collection and shift it into a big, we, we purchased a big railway container and put it on a spare um, section next door. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to do a full in inventory and also um, assess the collection for deck sessions, because um, I don't think that had ever been done. You know, we've been around since the 1950s and I don't think, <laughs> you know, it's, it's ever been properly done. So it's a huge um, thing to do. Uh, but with, with Vernon, I, I set up three templates for reports, and it's just made the whole um, process so much easier. The first is an inventory report where we go into the original collection store and we'll say, you know, a report of everything that's in the, a specific bay. And we go through and we find that we open up boxes and there's all sorts of disparate objects that sort of don't go together. Um, they've sort of been put in... I think mainly by chrono chronological order rather than like items. So what we're doing is we're um, tagging them and putting them into sort of virtual packing cases. So one bo box might have um, photo albums and um, book 
books and ephemera and maybe some souvenir teaspoons or <laughs> t-shirt or whatever. So we actually put them in sort of make, uh, uh, what I call them as virtual packing units. Um, so they're actually a position on a, on a um, shelf. And um, we got, once, once that's all been done, um, I print out the next report, which is a comparison report. And what we do is we get an expert in and we go through all the like items and we assess them for deaccessions. Um, and we tag the ones that are to be de um, deaccessioned. And then um, we go on to the third report, which is a deaccession report, which actually goes to the members of the, our committee who approve um, the deaccessions. So it's just sort of a three-step process and it's just great with um, Vernon because once you set up your templates, it just makes it a couple of couple of um, clicks and you're there. Uh, the committee's very happy because they get um, a wonderful report that has the photo, who donated it, why we're putting it up for a deaccession and where, we, where we'd like to rehouse it or where it's to go, whether it goes back to the donor or, or whatever. Um, so yes, I'd just like to um, really do a big shout out for the bulk move too, because once that deaccession process has been done, um, we can, for instance, maybe a collection of trench art, we, we nest them and store them properly into proper boxes. And then we uh, just do that one bulk move over into the container store, um, wherever it is. So it's all done in one movement. I don't know what anybody does without those packing units. Um, <laughs> they're just an amazing thing. Uh, we it's sort of a holding pattern in the um, container store too. That the collection will be there for a while until the building's done. So we've got very simple names for the packing units, but it's very easy to go. We can access the um, collection quite easy. If we're looking for a trench art, we go to the trench art packing case sort of thing. Um, I think later on when we get a much bigger um, collection store, we'll probably have some sort of numeric coding. But at the moment, this really works. So, you know, whether or not we carry on with it, um, this is, remains to be seen. That's probably it for me, so yes. Awesome, well thank you so much, Karen. I think uh, deaccessioning is often something we don't always talk about very much and it's definitely a big project to be doing and it's such a healthy process to be doing as well. Yes. Refining your collection is just such a good thing to be doing. Um, but oh, quite a big project on your hands too. Yes, yeah, two, two to three years we're thinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And of course, the building's probably been put a little bit back because of COVID, but um, you just watch the space, I think. Oh, yeah. exciting. Uh, and we'll flip over to Tapara. Tapara, would you mind introducing yourself? Oh, kia ora koutou. Tēnei te karanga, tēnei te pangi. Kia tūpera nā tātou, e te pai o ki te o marama tihei mauri ora. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Tapara. Um, I'm the collection registrar for the Whakatane Museum. Collections and Research, the Whare Taonga Takepake. Um, we're in the Bay of Plenty, North Island, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here today. And for those that haven't got their video cameras on, um, I hope you find yourself doing a little nod, head, you know, head nodding. Sign of empathy as um, we go through this five to six, seven uh, minute journey together. So the project I'm going to talk about is a um, 20 year conceptual idea um, coming into fruition or um, a redevelopment as such. But um, I'll give you guys a little bit of a, a background history about our, our um, small, um, humble museum. Um, the origins uh, trace back to 1933 when the Bay of Plenty Māori and Historical Research Society was formed. Um, and then in 1958, Jack London set up the Museum Fundraising Committee in order to build a more permanent home um, for the community's heritage collections. Um, in 1972, the Whakatane Museum was officially opened. In 1978, the first two-storied extension of our building was built, and the museum itself um, came under the Whakatane District Council under their control. Um, the second extension was in 1991, and that focused on expanding the collection storage and creating a community gallery um, reading room and uh, for our HD London Library. Um, so in essence, the Whakatane Museum collections uh, can be roughly quantified as holding over 600,000 images plus um, in our photographic collection, 100,000 Tonga and artifacts, 
1,200 boxes of manuscripts and newspapers, um, 500 plus maps, 10,000 plus books in our HD London Library. Um, it's just continuous as people bring things in. Um, the collections are regionally invaluable because um, they contain many items of national significance as well. So, um, so that's a little bit of a history um, into our small museum. But it's been over um, 20 years now since the idea of extending our building again um, to a much larger one to accommodate an ever increasing um, collection was spoken about. Uh, this discussion was not new, nor nor is it going to go away. So. Um, as, as collections, as people bring in stuff, we're just going to have to extend and extend and extend. Um, but the idea was initiated by many people um, that have worked in this institution back when the pencil ruled. Um, dark vivid pens or twink were preferred accessioning tool to permanently mark items. Um, collection management systems consisted of handwritten accession re registers, catalogue cards, chic cataloguing systems, um, in the 90s, Microsoft Access Database. <laughs> yeah, so um, I can recall we had the data from the Access Database transferred over into Vernon around 2007 or 2008. Um, and of course, there, there were minor discrepancies of terminology and fields, just like what Claire was mentioning. Um, you know, when you transfer, migrate that information over, we found that some fields were indifferent. But that's okay, you just go back and you, you fix those up. Um, in that time frame from 2006 to 2020, our museum had gone through six managers, uh, four council-wide restructures, um, as well as losing incredibly talented staff. So we're quite lucky to have accomplished not our dream building, um, but a practical operative building uh, for looking after our collections and, and now council records. Hmm, yeah. Um, so in 2017, we began packing down our collections into TPUs, which are, as you know, temporary uh, packing units. Um, most of our smaller collections had already been packed into conservation materials, assigned packing units, and we located in Vernon, so we had to concentrate on the larger items, non-accession items, receipted items, loose items that weren't packed, and how we account for their movements or location from on-site to off-site, um, packing them into TPUs and temporary packing units and creating records for those inside the Vernon database using the bulk movement tool made this an easy task. Um, whilst the Tonga objects or artifacts were being tubbed into TPUs, labels were created from Vernon, as well um, as using the word merge formatting tool, <laughs> look at Claire, um, and those labels were placed into the TPU packing units and located it to a temporary location that had been prepared for, for transport. So you have these um, kind of like these areas um, to, to place things. Um, and before um, they left the building, we created hard copy spreadsheets of the TPU packing units exported out of Vernon so that staff could tick off the TPUs as having left on site and relocated to off site as they were received at the other end. Um, that was one way we were able to track and record the mass amount of collections leaving the building. Uh, now, as collections were being packed into TPUs, their short shelving units, so all the shelving units were being deinstalled and then uh, shifted, transported down to offsite and re erected um, so that the TPUs uh, were able to be located back onto those shelving units. And of course, they still had their same locations inside Vernon. Um, so that made it easier to relocate. Um, but as I said, we, uh, there were many people involved in the conception of this vision, but only a handful of museum staff, um, contractors and volunteers from other council departments that were able to see the end of this project. Um, Vernon and, and the knowledge of the Vernon database played a crucial part in, in our project, but the perseverance and curiosity of a couple of contractors made it easy uh, for them to learn Vernon, you know. So we, we lost a few essential staff during the redevelopment um, and training enthusiastic contractors made the job easier. The contractors proved their weight in gold, actually, um, when they were able to handle collections, packing of collections, recording, using the movement logs, using the things that we exported out of Vernon, um, labelling, you know, creating labels in Vernon, 
shifting and lifting 600, you know, plus 30, 50 kg tubs, um, shifting, relocated, relocating thousands of packing units, um, hundreds of elongated heavy collections, learning the basics of Vernon, database came easy to them. So um, they were quite methodical, but we were unstoppable. Um, and again, only a handful of people. So the challenges at the time for us, and may I say, we're just women. You know, there are only four women um, involved in this. Um, we were still inside the building whilst they were demolishing and redeveloping around us. Um, space became an issue as the project was in three phases, creating a juggling act of packing, deinstalling shelving units, relocating, then re-erecting shelving units at offsite. Restructure happened during our redevelopment. Um, senior museum staff were unavailable due to the restructure or other uh, variables. Um, we had to rely on contractors and staff from other council departments to train and upskill in museum practices, including Vernon. Um, training was achieved between moving collections or hiatus. <laughs> um, more than one project was initiated during this time because the opportunity to deaccession arose. Yes, Karen, that became an opportunity as well. Um, but the challenges for a small museum like us, it was budget constraints, you know, not having enough of a budget to afford on-site training or enough subscriptions for Vernon. Um, staff not having the opportunity to use Vernon consistently and therefore becoming more familiar with the database would have made it easier for, for them to. Certain staff are still finding it difficult to see how um, our manuscripts, archives and books can be recorded and accessioned into Vernon. I think it's a matter of which fields would be suitable. So there's a few things there. Um, but yeah, it, that's me. That's me. So, um, Nora Eira, Kumutu Toku Korero, Tina Kaito Kaito Kapo. Thank you so much, Tapra. I just, I'm, I've heard some of this before, but honestly, still in awe of how much you pulled off. <laughs> uh, not an easy task to be doing. Um, we've had one question that's come through to Claire. Um, Claire, you were talking about how you managed to find everything that doesn't have a copyright um, attached to it. Would you mind explaining a bit more about how you managed to do that? Yes, so um, as I said, in the old database, uh, some of the records, they did have copyright already attached, but when it transferred over to Vernon, the copyright owner didn't come up. So what I decided to do was go through and manually check every single record to see if we had a physical copy of the copyright agreement and then I'd scan it and save it. But as for the current ones and the historical ones, what we've done is a search on Vernon for any um, record without copyright owner. So I, I, I use the select statement um, function and then it produced any, any work that didn't have um, any text at all in that particular field. So I went through and checked every single one and then we, that's, how, that's how we've identified which ones still need copyright approval. And then we decided to target each ones in, in batches. So we're doing, you know, A to E at the moment um, by artists. And we've got to update old forms as well. So some of, because Deakin is an amalgamation of a range of institutions that came before it, like Victoria College. So we have some copyright agreements which are also out of date. So um, particularly, you know, because some of the early ones have said we give permission to use it on the World Wide Web, you know, and other, other, way, other things that are slightly out of date so we've been working to update that as well so does that answer the question yeah no that sounds perfect um hopefully if that doesn't then someone will pop in with a question oh no that's satisfied that one um i suppose for me in terms of a discussion i would be really curious as to all of us have incorrect and incomplete data that often predates using vernon or might even be from using vernon how have each of you tackled managing this it can be quite a big task i think the the way to start is to break it down into chunks i think um, to identify what key gaps of data is missing. So just spend a couple of hours sitting down in Vernon going, looking for records without information in 
X field? Like, do we have any uh, records that are missing images? Do we have any records that are missing credit lines? And then I actually made up a little list um, with all the fields and how many of them were missing. And then we looked at that list and said, okay, we need to prioritise these two, then, then these ones. So you do a sort of little grading scale of which ones are the most significant for the overall, you know, data. And that, that's how we've been approaching it. And every, you know, every now and then we continually have meetings as a team as well. And because that's one of the great things about small museums is you're in constant contact with everybody and you can sit down and say, okay, um, this is where we're up to with this project. Do we need to continue or should we change our focus? So, yeah, constant communication and constant checking on where your projects are up to to see if it's still relevant, I think, is really important. A lot of... Um you know, what we have in museums um, are vague records anyway. You know, they're vague records. It's what we produce from those vague records and how we research um, using other areas. Like, um, I think we go through old accession registers, minutes of meetings, um, uh, minutes of, of meetings with not only... Um, uh, the museum, but also, you know, there's just so much information that you have to grasp from bits and from pull it from other areas. Um, you know, we could have um, a thousand things that come in and we have absolutely no record of, of where it could have come from. But what you have to do is you have to pull um, information from somewhere. Um, and then, you know, when, when I first looked at the transition from when, when everything on objective on the old um, access database was transferred over to, to Vernon, the information was um, scarce. You know, the, you, you could see it in the records as you, as you just scrolled through many records, you could see that only certain fields were filled. And that was, um, you know, always the accession number or other ID. Um, maybe if it was a gift or donation, maybe if it was a loan, um, maybe um, where it came from, you know, there were, there were a lot of variables, but what you had to do was fill in the gaps. What I found with Vernon is that um, it allows you to do that, but you're still investigating. You have to be the investigator of all this stuff. Um, and, and your records, they always start off vague anyway. You know, it, it's how you are creative and actually managing that and how much research you're prepared to do. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot well, we started with a lot of vague records. What we've started to do, though, is that we've drawn that line in the sand and we've, we've now put up a template and we've, we've actually said to our staff that come in, we need this. When we catalogue, this is how you do it, you know, and these are the areas that need to be uh, filled in. It, it goes all the way to your workflow, you know, even when you have that object entry and what you expect when, when it comes through, the conversations that you have with the person, with the donor, with the lender, when they bring it into your small museum, you now have um, that time to actually spend with people and sit down and talk through all those. You know, so your records, I'm thinking, you know, 2007 is when I said that we transferred our stuff from the old objective database to Vernon. I'm expecting from that date onwards, our records should, should not be vague, you know, so... <laughs> I don't know. So the approach we've taken uh, is through our exhibitions. So each exhibition we do is actually this brilliant opportunity to research objects we have. And for example, to mention Fanny Gray again, we did not have her birth and death dates. You know, our star, you know, first female graduate. And so out of the uh, dental show I've just spoken about, we found that an amazing information about her life. She, she just had the most extraordinary life. And so with that, we systematically follow through. And there are all these objects we looked at that didn't end up in the exhibition, but we've still gathered information, done extra research, and built uh, that body of knowledge uh, in the database, as well as adding images, because we take the opportunity to photograph items we haven't photographed before. Yes, for, for me, um, you know, a good thing is the authority term report replace. If we find um, mistakes with uh, cataloguing and things like that, it's quite an easy um, 
process to create lists and then change the authority terms and sort of get everything in line. And we've done a lot of that recently with our process. We've found sort of funny little categories that don't really, there might only be two or three things in them or whatever. And, you know, you can actually tidy it all up as you go along. But I find that really good. We've had a question from Erica Taylor. Um, how have each of you kept up team morale when you're dealing with these huge projects that I'm sure seem endless at times? Milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no um, you're, you're quite right. Because, um, team morale, especially we started off with a team of strong nine and then we went down to team one and then having to um, engage with uh, bringing in other people from other departments. So um, com communication, communication is key. And, and making sure that you have an action plan, especially with a project, a huge project, you have to have an action plan. You have um, these relationships with not only your staff, but you also have these relationships with the external contractors. So it's more or less making, I made sure that the staff that were with me um, moved with me, you know, um, and they came first as far as I was concerned. You know, the architect, the, the project manager, the council workers, all, you know, when they came in, it was, no, hang on, um, my staff come first because we're the ones that are here looking after the collection. And that came first for us you know, making sure that our artefacts, our taonga, everything was was packed safely and that it was um, all recorded, identified, physically identified, and um, that we were physically and mentally, um, as staff, prepared for the day. But it was making sure that we had those action plans. Another good incentive was um, if one of us were tired, we would all stop would all stop and we would all have a break and I would send our project manager to go and get milkshakes or, um, you know, to go and uh, get us all a, a hot chocolate or to go off site and go and get us a, um, a, a smoothie, something sustainable. But it was about, you know, whaka whanonga for us, which is, to keep, you know, um, keeping us all together and, and healthy in mind, you know, and in body because we, um, we, we needed to stay on task, but communication is key. And, and the other thing too is that we shared the load. Um, even though we had one person who was writing the action plans and making sure that the day was gonna go smoothly, we made sure that we all, um, we were all of the same level, so we didn't have a hierarchical level. That, that for me went out the door. You know, okay, you have your, your manager, your curator, your registrar, your, that, that went out the door. That, that we had to let that lie because we all needed to be able to, to work together. So, yeah, that's my, my whakaro anyway. Kia ora. Kia ora. How, how do you others feel about, how have you managed to keep staff morale up, especially when you're tackling big well, projects? I'm, I'm going to give a very Melbourne answer. <laughs> Any of you have heard of Brunetti, which is an iconic... Um, coffee and cake shop in Ligon Street. <laughs> uh, I have a very small team. We work very hard. We don't have big breaks. They know we're kicking goals when I bring in the Brunetti cakes because <laughs> it's always a, a, a sign that we've turned a corner. And also I have a lot of student volunteers and they know they've done really well when they get the Brunetti cakes as well. So it isn't a regular thing. It's something we do as a celebration. And Alex, uh, who's been one of my team and just rejoined me, knows this only too well. And she has known to bake a cake and bring that in as well. Oh, yum. Um, it is exactly what you were saying before. It, it's celebrating um, the things that need to be celebrated. But as we all know, because we're in small teams, we all work really hard and we often don't take the breaks we need. So I think it's really important to pick those moments when we can celebrate or even uh, commiserate 
over a disaster. That, that can often be worthy of a Brunetti cakes as well <laughs> in that regard. I think uh, celebrating small goals is really is really a good way to do that as well. Like, for example, I'll say, look, at the start of the year, we had this many records that we had to tidy up and it's been three months and because of lockdown, look how many we've achieved. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, and also, like you all said, regu regular communication is so important. So we actually, in lockdown, we have a team catch up every single day just to touch base and see how everybody's going and check in regularly. And, you know, um, because we, we're a small team and all working together, we can just even send emails just saying, well done. It's awesome that you got that contact. Great that we got that bit done. So, but when we're in the office, we do have a biscuit barrel as well. Yeah, we tend to have the coffees. We tend to have the coffees, uh, the lattes. We've got a lovely place just across the road, so we really enjoy um, supporting them. But we also, you know, we get given pet projects. So, you know, if, we, if there's something we want to do in the background, some sort of favourite bit of research or um, if we have a strength that, you know, we want to work on, we do get time to do that as well um, and amongst the other things. And it's quite nice to be able to, for instance, um, over lockdown, I kind of discovered a kind of, Quite a fascinating story about the Cambridge Fire Brigade and how that was set up and how it linked into how um, Cambridge developed and all the rest of it. So I've sort of been doing that and that's a fun thing that, you know, we have a little bit of latitude to, to have these pet projects um, and have spend a bit of time each week sort of developing those. It's, um, um, Elizabeth is, has got a real strength in education programs and she does little quizzes and things for the kids and that sort of thing that she really enjoys. So. Um, and um, Catherine, she's got a real strength in research and she's great with people. So, yeah, we sort of do the things we enjoy. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really wonderful as well to be able to give um, staff and yourself space to choose a passion project and to let them have time to spend on, like, even if it's not always you're on a big project, to be like, actually, you're allowed to have a little bit of time to do something you really like. Yeah, <laughs> it is important, I think. Remember what we're here for. Yeah. Um, I suppose I've got another question for you in that uh, Motat's mentioned that they're really happy about all the talk about deaccessioning. And so I was wondering if anyone would be willing to share maybe some of the challenges or some of the joys that they found in deaccessioning. Yes. Um, I realise this can be sometimes a bit more of a hot topic, but if anyone's willing to share some of their experiences, that'd be great. Um, just because we've just been doing it recently, just with an example, um, you know, when we have all the, say, shaving razors in one group and we look at them, um, you know, we're looking at, we might have a dozen of them, but um, they've been collected over many years. Some people have just got them from op shops and offered them, you know, and they would have offered them in the 60s and 70s. Um, so we tend to look at things, if, if it has an engraving of, say, a Cambridge business on it, well, you know, we definitely keep that. If it has the uh, provenance of an important person, maybe, you know, we know who's actually owned it, we, you know, we'll keep that as well. We may keep an excellent example. It may have no provenance, but it's just a fantastic looking example. Um, but the others, if they're, if they're broken, they, they're not good examples, they don't have any provenance, um, we look at re um, sending them perhaps to other other museums or um, passing them back to the donor. Um, but that's, you know, that way we've just got a nice tight collection. You know, we know everything there is there for a reason. And um, we try and get as much information, of course, into our provenance and research um, fields and learning as we possibly can. So that we know that, you know, we're within the collection policy, which is, you know, collecting things with a Cambridge connection, so. Hmm. <laughs> Um, so, um, similar kind of thing during our project, our huge redevelopment project, it, it, was, it gave us an opportunity to look at deaccessioning some of our items. Um, as, as things were being um, transferred or transported to our um, off-site area, um, staff were able to look at um, the condition of a lot of our um, artifacts, um, objects, taonga. Um, so one thing we took into consideration first and foremost was when we were conditioning, re, um, condition reporting them down the other end at our off-site, um, they were put onto a list. We had three lists. 
One list was to return back to the collections. Another list was for investigation. And that's, that means further investigation as in like what Karen was talking about, um, provenance, um, background history, things like that. And the other list was um, was the maybes. <laughs> the maybes. <laughs> I'm sure that's what we ended up putting it under. Because when you work with council, um, they just wanted us to deck session everything that they saw that was um, what is it? Not aesthetically appealing. Um, yeah. So we, we had to actually um, change their way of thought, their way of thinking, and um, re refer them to our policy. Um, but, uh, you know, not necessarily this cup, this chip in this cup. It may be just a cup with a chip, but it may have belonged to, you know, so there's always a story, there's always a history. Um, but that, that was what we ended up doing. We, we put them into three groups. Um, and after dealing with that, we um, ended up with a roundabout out of all our artifacts. We came down to a listing of 180 items. Um, and then that was, you know, for us, that was huge. That was a huge accomplishment to, to come out with only a, you know, with only a handful of things that either we couldn't find the provenance, they were damaged, uh, they had mould, you know, um, they were, uh, yeah, there were so many facets, so many variables again, but that was how we came to this listing. The next thing we had to do was take that to our um, acquisition panel, you know, because they, as things come in, they have to have a process for leaving as well. So our acquisition, our acquisition panel are working through that right now. But yeah, that was how we started. It, it was um, forced upon us in a way to to have to do a de accession at the same time as a redevelopment. Mm. Yeah. With us, uh, de accessioning is always uh, a challenge. Uh, it's always that marvelous example of the National Guard of Victoria who de accessioned Tiffany Glass, their, tip, their leading Tiffany Glass collection in the uh, 1920s because the director didn't like it. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to really uh, look at these things carefully. And some of the things that have come into our collections have not been appropriately evaluated on the way in. And so exactly the points you've made uh, in terms of their condition, in terms of their provenance, in terms of uh, their connection uh, with the collections policy. So we are looking at our collections from that perspective. And we have started with looking at uh, damaged items. And particularly, we had a series of basically very famous uh, paintings in the medical history collection. But in fact, they were prints of those paintings. And they've got that lovely green color that they get when they've been overexposed to light, because they probably were in the doctor's surgery before they were donated to us. So on the surface, it looks like a great thing when you actually read what's in the catalogue, but when you actually go to the item, you realise that um, it maybe should never have been with us. And in fact, it's in such terrible condition, it's irretrievable. So we have uh, carefully and respectfully uh, looked at items and taken them to our committee for deaccessioning. Uh, because it's important, uh, you know, to, to the quality overall of the collection and, and the cost of keeping the collection. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we've argued when we bring these things forward. Uh, but if, you know, the donor might have been a significant person, we, of course, would make contact with the donor and indicate what is happening. So we do it in a respectful manner. Um, and we're just progressively going through the collection like the three collections. I think uh, with us, in, in the last few years since I've been at Deakin, we haven't really done a lot of deaccessioning, but during the audit process, we've identified some works that need to have their status investigated. So I think that's going to be our next big project after we've finished with the copyright and a few other things. So it's on the cards. Awesome. Well, I think we're almost out of time, but I'll try and sneak in one last question. Um, 
I suppose just as a really quick summary at the end, what are you proudest of, of a project that you've completed most recently? Just something that you just, you think, gosh, we did that well. <laughs> it's hard for us, especially Kiwis and I guess Australians as well to shine a little bit of a light on ourselves, but I would really like to hear what you think. Gosh, we did this really well. I'm most proud of an exhibition we did called The Art of Healing. Uh, we commissioned 60 works by Australian uh, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders people that, uh, it, which acknowledged healing practice. Uh, that was an initiative of the Medical History Museum. It came out of um, the fact that we did not represent Indigenous knowledge in our collection and we wanted to show uh, it was past, present and future. And we did this in consultation uh, with key uh, Indigenous academics at the University of Melbourne, Marcia Langton and Sean Ewan, and directly approached uh, 60 different communities. It then toured to London and uh, Berlin, and uh, those works are on display uh, throughout the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. And we have ensured, and what was important as well, was that it included, um, you know, uh, language, skin, all the appropriate information that we were told by uh, these communities and artists that they would like um, to include, including how they wanted it spelt, uh, what they wanted to say about the works, and it was not prescriptive what we asked. We just, uh, we made an offer for people to say what they would like to share. And uh, it, it, I think, has formed a basis for ongoing collecting in this manner at the University of Melbourne. Um, hmm. Good question, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Um, I think uh, for our institution, um, during the redevelopment again, during that project, um, I think we were lucky to have the Vernon database because we were able to um, we were able to move things swiftly within a time frame. And we were able to make sure that everything was moved comfortably, recorded on the other end. And then when we moved back safely into the building, um, again, everything was uh, safely placed back into their locations. Um, and having the, I think, the trust of the community and the trust of um, iwi and whānau families, tribes, families, um, that, that loan their items into our institution. They actually trusted us during that time to still do right by their by their family heirlooms, you know, um, and take care of them whilst we're in a redevelopment uh, um, project. So we we were, yeah, I, I I think you know that that for me was a huge thing because you're responsible for the community's collection and you're responsible for um, these families' tribal um, heirlooms. So for them to trust in us and to allow us to, to do that huge project, yeah, I think that was an accomplishment in itself. Because where I am, um, we're pretty much Matatsu Arohe, which is, uh, it consists of, if you've ever heard of Naituhoi, that's a really harsh tribe in New Zealand <laughs> to have to, um, talk with and to negotiate with. Um, we're smack in the middle of Ngāti Awa, which is another amazing tribe in itself. You know, we have, I think, reasonably quite a few tribes that we have to have these conversations with. So for them to trust in us to do our job and to take care of their taonga um, during that time, yeah, that was a huge accomplishment for us, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think what we punched above our weight in is probably our family research. Um, you know, we really do uh, have a lot of happy people leave 
um, the Cambridge Museum after we've come in and just made a, by the way, you know, I've had somebody here and we've found so many hits for people. And um, someone recently came in and, you know, we found this, um, he was a descent, uh, I think it was a great grandmother, but we had a teapot, a school photo, um, you know, some rates records. We actually have a meat register, an old meat register from the turn of the century that shows, you know, how much meat people bought in those days, you know, and they had their signature and things on it. Also a police charge book. So if your great, great grand uncle was had up for driving on the pavement, you know, we've, we've got it all in there <laughs> and there's some amazing things. So, you know, people come in, we put a name in and it's, um, we're just really proud of what we're doing there. So, yeah, that's probably our one. All thanks to <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I'm I'm really proud of um, all the things that we've managed to achieve as a as a small team, um, because you know in in small museums you you have a job title, but you pitch in and help with everything. And that's one of the things I really love about it is the variety and the range of projects that you get to do. So we've produced a, a huge range of exhibitions as well as um, not, not just using our own collection, but bringing in works from other collections as well as, um, you know, doing an annual audit and um, a lot of public programs as well. So we do a lot. And I just had one example and I thought of, in, I think it was 2017, we actually produced a book um, selecting highlights from the collection. Uh, we had a limited amount of time and a limited amount of resources to put that in. So everybody in the team really pitched in to get copyright approvals, get high res photos, get people to write articles about the artworks. Um, and we've produced a book, which I'm really proud of. And I think it's a great, a great way to highlight some of the, some of the works in our collection, but just to show some of the things that we do and why we're a really valuable resource for people so honestly thank you all so much for sharing today I feel very privileged to be able to listen to you and to hear what you have to say because it is wonderful to hear your stories and also the hard work that you do you do a lot of hard work and I fully appreciate all of that it leads to you having such great collections um, and I think I can definitely speak on behalf of the attendees of just thank you for your time and thank you for your wisdom today um, and we'll be in touch again soon. Hopefully we can make this something of a bit more regular catch-ups. Mm. Oh, yes, thanks everyone for attending and hopefully see you this afternoon when we look at cataloging the unusual and our feature request panel, which will be tomorrow. Um, until then, take care, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Hey, everybody. <laughs>